Okay, so uh, thanks for coming. So I'm glad that you managed to hang on on the last day. And uh, so my name is Ying Zhen, and I'm currently a assistant professor at um, Imperial College London. So um, um, today I'm going to talk about basic neural networks. And I think maybe in previous days, you sort of hear about people saying, oh, you are, these things are getting used in other pipelines. So and maybe you've got questions to actually to other lecturers in terms of um, properties of basic neural networks. So um, I think today's lecture is going to be basic neural networks all the way that uh, I'm going to talk about the introduction stuff, and hopefully we can get some uh, hands-on um, uh, tutorials uh, together. Um, and this afternoon, I believe Miguel, uh, Miguel Holandes Roberto is going to talk about the more advanced stuff. Okay. Okay. So let me start by motivating uh, why you need this. So uh, you all heard about deep learning. I don't need to repeat how great they are. Right, so it has been applied to many of different applications in vision and text and speech, right? And uh, uh, people also are very interested in trying to apply these things to say more critical setups like uh, healthcare, for example, like medical imaging, right? So um, actually, I think in one of the summer schools uh, in 2016, I think this is one of the deep learning summer schools that Jeff Hinton attended. So Jeff Hinton actually made the uh, following statement that uh, uh, because at that time, he saw you know, very promising results of deep neural networks applied to medical imaging. So he said, uh, um, we don't need to train radiologists in five years because machines can soon do this. But now it's already 2022. So six years after this statement, uh, we are still not there. So still quite a lot of and say radiologists have been trained and they are not losing their job yet. <laughs> Okay, so the main reason for that is basically the task in healthcare, like um, AI assisted decision making for medical treatment, is a very high risk decision making task. So doctors will decide on the treatment based on the diagnosis results. And some treatments, if not all, could have quite severe side effects if you are uh, using the wrong dose. Right, so doctors will basically ask, you know, whatever uh, AI assisted uh, decision making system, including the deep neural network, are you sure about your prediction and why? So, unfortunately, um, at least for deterministic neural networks, um, um, it's hard for them to give a sort of a calibrated uh, answer on these questions from doctors, like, are you how are you sure about this and why? Right, so the reliability of you know, the AI system for these healthcare applications are questionable. Okay, so typically uh, for high risk tasks such as uh, these things in medical domain, it is very important to give uncertainty estimates on the prediction results, right? So that's basically what brings up to uh, this summer school. I mean, there are definitely methods of, of uncertainty estimation uh, techniques in also in the frequencies domain. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm Bayesian. Okay, so uh, today we are going to focus on uh, Bayesian methods applied to neural networks, and which are, uh, they will actually perform uh, posterior inference to quantify the uncertainty of the prediction output. Okay, so just to remind you what uh, is Bayesian inference. Okay, so um, basically in Bayesian inference, we are basically trying to build probabilistic models by you know um, specifying the generative process of a particular data set, right? And in particular for this, uh, say, a supervised learning setup, you are going to build a, uh, for example, parametric model, right? And then you put a prior. Um, distribution on the parameters of your model. So this explains why you have uh, uh, the prior here, right? So once you've uh, uh, observed data, right, then you can basically try to compute the posterior distribution of the uh, parameters you're interested in given data. And this is the famous base rule um, coming from I think 16, um, well, 18th um, century or something like 1700-ish. I can't remember the exact dates, but yeah, so it is a very old rule, but still uh, very ubiquitously uh, applicable. 
Okay, so just to mention again, so P, yeah, P theta is the prior distribution. Okay, so uh, P data given theta is basically the likelihood of the uh, uh, prom of the parameters given data. For example, usually in deep learning, you will use um, say uh, cross entropy loss or say auto loss, and they correspond to the uh, negative log likelihood of the parameters you are interested in. Okay, so we've talked about the uh, uh, Bayes rule for posterior distribution, right? And then in prediction, uh, for, and then okay, for here we also have what is called a marginal likelihood, right? Which is basically trying to compute under my model. Uh, the probability of your data appearing under this assumption. And this requires you to compute uh, this integral problem. Okay, I forgot uh, a D theta here, but anyway. Okay, so yeah, so this is essentially the whole framework of uh, Bayesian inference. It applies to not only say Bayesian neural networks, but just in general, uh, any uh, say Bayesian modeling paradigm. Okay. So uh, it looks very simple conceptually, but um, the main challenge for most of the Bayesian modeling paradigm is essentially how to compute posterior inference, right? So um, you know, usually speaking, for posterior inference, you are interested in the uh, posterior distribution itself, but uh, in practice, when you actually want to use your models, right, you are actually interested in, in some sense, like the moment of the posterior. So when I say moment, it means that uh, you have uh, some sort of function f in interest, for example, like the uh, output of the model under model averaging or under the average of the posterior or something like the uh, mean and variance of the uh, theta parameters on the posterior. Okay, so um, this is essentially the central equation in most of the uh, Bayesian modeling um, pipeline that you actually need to compute. Okay, so let me just give you an example that is more relevant to uh, regression. Okay, so usually in regression, right? So once you've um, um, observed the data, you are interested in to see how does your model perform in prediction time, right? So that means at some unseen locations like here, you want to actually produce um, the prediction output. And definitely, as I motivated before, you know, uh, it is very critical to have uncertainty estimates for uh, applications like healthcare. So that means we are interested in not only a point estimate of the prediction output, but also sort of like a um, uncertainty estimate, either in terms of like a confidence interval or credible intervals, um, depending on whether you are frequently or Bayesian, right? So uh, yes, essentially we are also interested in outputting this um, uh, interval here, right? So if you are going to do this under the Bayesian uh, modeling paradigm, then essentially this F function, the moment you are interested in will be the, uh, uh, distribution of your output given the uh, input x and also the parameter setup, right? And uh, you're going to compute this by, you know, averaging the prediction results over all possible setup of your parameters under the posterior. Okay, so this will be the problem that we are going to focus on for today. So um, I hope this is um, uh, clear enough in terms of uh, uh, the overall framework. So let me know uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to be interrupted, okay? So next I'm going to talk about what uh, um, you are coming for, okay? So um, I'm going to tell you um, briefly how basic neural network works, right? So usually speaking, we are going to build neural networks for the, uh, say, uh, regression tasks or classification tasks that we are interested in. For example, let's say we are interested in classifying different types of uh, animal images. Okay, so um, typically you're going to build a neural network for this, right? So a neural network is essentially a series of uh, nonlinear transformations defined by uh, simple uh, layers you know, that contains, uh, say, linear transformation and then nonlinearity, right? And in this case, uh, you can basically see that the parameters that we are going to uh, feed uh, basically, you know, the network weights and biases for each of the layers. So these essentially are um, collect for the theta parameters that we are going to estimate. Okay, 
So, yes, a typical deep learning solution is basically you're going to propose some loss function and then you've uh, minimized that loss function to uh, fit the uh, parameters theta, right? So, um, Many of the loss functions like uh, um, L2 loss or cross entropy loss uh, do have a probabilistic uh, um, um, meaning that, uh, for example, if you are using cross entropy loss, right, then the negation of it basically just corresponds to the log probability of a uh, categorical distribution. So, yeah, so essentially, this is saying that uh, uh, cross entropy loss fitting is essentially the same as doing maximum likelihood estimate of the uh, parameters for the neural network. Okay, so once you've done this, right, with a point estimate, then the easiest thing you can do for prediction is essentially um, uh, use that fitted parameters uh, to parameterize your neural network and then just use that uh, training neural network to uh, get a prediction. Okay, but as we said, uh, we want to do Bayesian stuff. Okay, so in Bayesian modeling, we are interested in not only not not the point estimate but actually the uh posterior distribution of the parameters so that basically means that first we are going to have a uh, prior distribution p theta on the neural network parameters and um in most of the cases uh, that i'm going to talk about today uh we are going to assume we are going to have a gaussian prior with zero mean and uh, uh, some variance so this is a convenient choice okay so uh yeah so uh once you've observed your uh data set p of uh, data set d and then you can basically compute the posterior distribution based just using base rule so conceptually okay for a moment um so assume you have the Posterior distribution, right? Then in prediction time, we can basically do what we call the Bayesian predictive uh, distribution um, by computing here the distribution of Y star uh, given X star, the new location, and the data set by you know averaging the prediction results over your posterior. Okay, so this is the conceptual framework that you can think about it. But if you actually want to compute it, it's not that easy, okay? So uh, the posterior distribution itself is almost always uh, intractable as long as you have uh, some nonlinear transformation of the uh, parameters in your uh, likelihood term. And this is definitely the case for neural networks. So instead, what is happening in practice is approximate Bayesian inference, okay? So the first step, is essentially you are trying to get a simpler distribution that somehow can approximate the posterior in a good way. Assume you can get that, right? Then in prediction time, for the Bayesian predictive distribution, we are going to replace the exact um, posterior with the approximate posterior Q. So that is the only difference right now, okay? And uh, uh, in practice, usually this expectation is estimated using Monte Carlo estimation, which basically means that as long as you can sample from this simpler Q distribution, right? Then you basically just get some samples of the new normal weights from this Q distribution and then compute the prediction for each of them and then average. Okay, so I hope so far this uh, framework, at least conceptually is uh, clear to you. Okay, so before we go to the technical details in terms of how we actually uh, find this Q distribution, I'm trying, I'm going to tell you, you know, roughly speaking, what we are looking for uh, with a small example. Okay, so uh, previously we asked, we said that we are going to use approximate inference, right? And actually the quality of uh, approximate inference is going to be crucial for the performance of a Bayesian neural networks in practice. And let's see why this is the case. Okay, so first, because we are going to have a distribution over the weights of the neural network, right? Then you can basically think about a Bayesian neural network as an ensemble of infinite number of neural networks. Okay, so basically this means that in practice with Monte Carlo sampling, you are going to first sample a bunch of weights, right? And then for each of the weights, you can actually parameterize a neural network, then you're going to have a committee of neural networks, like an ensemble. Okay, so 
in this case, now uh, give a new um, test image like this panda image here. So you're going to ask each of the community member in this ensemble, what is the prediction? And they will basically produce uh, the prediction and then you can do some average uh, estimate, okay? So in this case, you know, these samples um, you know, perhaps can get the right answers on this image. Okay, so now let's consider the setup where the test output, test input is out of the training distribution or even an adversarial input. Okay, so um, yes, we have we've seen maybe in some papers that uh, uh, neural networks are vulnerable to adversarial inputs, but there are there are some hopes here for the basic neural networks because, as I said, a basic neural network is an infinite um, ensemble. So the posterior can, can potentially contain a diverse set of solutions. So that basically means that the committee members in this uh, ensemble, some of them might be able to actually get the right answer. You know, so that means uh, it is possible that the, the Bayesian neural network could become more robust to perturbations. Okay, so besides robustness, um, data neural networks can also provide uncertainty for detecting out of distribution examples. So you can basically see that in this case, right? So although some of the networks provide the correct answer, some of them provide wrong answers, they basically you see there are this, there exists disagreement between them. And disagreement is a form of uncertainty. Right. So this basically means that even if the committee makes the wrong prediction on this adversary uh, input, you can still use the uncertainty estimate from them to tell, OK, yeah, I made the wrong answer, but uh, I can tell um, maybe this is an example out of the distribution so that uh, you should uh, be aware of it. Okay, so I hope, hope this is clear in terms of a potential advantage of a basic neural networks in uh, this, uh, say, uh, robust classification and out of distribution detection setup. But um, this advantage only comes when you actually have a good posterior approximation. Okay, so let's imagine another example that uh, you're going to have a Q distribution that uh, somehow poorly approximated the posterior, like uh, very close to a delta distribution, basically a, a, the mass is centering around a point. So in this case, essentially all the committee members you sample from this distribution um, um, are going to be the same committee member. Right, so then you're going back to the uh, usual uh, regime of these missing neural networks and the problems of the missing neural networks of, comes back. Okay, so this is not good. But also at the same time, if you actually have a, you know, maybe way too underconfident or flat approximation to the posterior, then in this case, um, you know, this approximate posterior definitely uh, suffers a lot from underfitting issues in the sense that even for the clean input, um, the committee fails to produce the right answer in a sort of like a um, um, highly agreed way, okay? So I'm hoping that uh, from this example, you can basically see that yes, the Bayesian paradigm is great, but in practice, if you really want to make it work, the uh, approximate inference methods that you're going to use will play a crucial role. Okay, so let's summarize what we've got so far and in terms of the technical challenges that uh, we are going to solve. Okay, so we said that we are interested in computing the posterior or approximating the posterior of the uh, uh, basic neural networks, right? So there are a few key steps that you need to consider in terms of doing approximate inference in basic neural networks. So first, you need to define the class of distribution Q that you want uh, to construct in order to approximate the posterior, right? So uh, usually speaking, we are going to have define a parametric form for that, basically for example, say restricting the Q distribution to be uh, some Gaussian. We are going to talk about that later. Um, okay, and there are definitely exist non-Gaussian approximations, but since this is an introductory uh, course, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, 
So yes. So once you fix the uh, family of the Q distribution, right? Now the second part is to find the, the best Q distribution within that, let's say, Gaussian family, right? To approximate the posterior. And uh, the way you do that is typically you are going to define some objective functions and then uh, minimize that objective function uh, to get the best uh, Q distribution. Today we are going to talk about variation inference. Okay, so yeah, so once you've uh, fitted this Q distribution, then yet yeah, in prediction time, you just do uh, what I said before, right? By computing the approximation of the Bayesian predictive by sampling from this Q distribution, get some neural networks from, from that and then compute the average. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So let me explain what we are going to talk about today. So um, basically, uh, since this is an introductory course, I'm going to explain to you how you can do a mean field version inference for Bayesian neural networks. Okay, and then uh, there will be some hands-on uh, um, tutorial. I hope you have uh, your laptop uh, ready that you're actually going to do some programming exercises. Okay, and there are some um, uh, case studies that might be interesting to play. Okay, so yeah, so that's basically today's uh, agenda. And uh, uh, let me go through uh, the basics first, and then you can uh, start to do the fun stuff. Okay, yes. Yeah, so just by the way, the uh, mean field version inference uh, in basic neural networks it is also called uh, based by backdrop. Yeah, so this is the... Uh, posterior or base rule that I just mentioned before, right? So we want to compute the uh, posterior distribution of the parameters given data. So basically the main obstacle in this uh, posterior is essentially the denominator here, basically the marginal likelihood, because if you want to compute it, then you need to actually compute a pretty complicated integration problem that uh, uh, no one knows how to analytically compute it. Okay, even uh, uh, simulation or multi-level estimate for that can also be quite challenging in um, many cases. So, as we discussed before, yeah, we have a very complicated posterior for which we want to use the uh, a simpler distribution to approximate it. And this simpler distribution might come from a parametric form that uh, uh, have some parameters phi that we call variational parameters that we want to fit. Okay, so now we need to design an objective function to do that, right? So in some sense, if you want to uh, minimize uh, or kind of get a good approximation to the posterior, right? Then a naive way to think about it is to get a, a distance or divergence measure to measure the difference or the distance between the two distribution, right? And then trying to minimize that divergence. And this is what we are going to do. So yes, so we are going to use what is called KL divergence um, uh, to measure the uh, difference between the exact posterior and the approximate posterior. So um, um, I hope that you've uh, kind of get, already get uh, very bored about seeing KL divergence, but let me just repeat. So um, yeah, so this is the KL divergence from the Q distribution to some P distribution, okay? It has this interesting form that you need to compute the log density ratio and then compute the expectation of this log density ratio under the Q distribution, okay? So it has some nice property that, uh, um, when P equals to Q, KL is zero, right? And otherwise KL is greater than zero, although there are some sort of um, theoretical kind of caveats, but uh, for, for now you just, uh, uh, we are just happy with that. Uh, this can be used as a way to measure the difference between uh, the Q and the uh, P, uh, P distribution. Okay, so now we've got a divergence measure. So we want to minimize it, right? So we can basically get a good uh, posterior, uh, uh, posterior approximation by minimizing the KL divergence from the Q distribution to the inside posterior, okay? So here is just a way we are going to write the KL divergence, but you notice that in the log density ratio, uh, the posterior still exists, right? And the posterior itself, previously we already said that we cannot compute it. But uh, there are some interesting catch, right? So if you write down what is the base rule for posterior, right? Which gives you this uh, density ratio between the joint and uh, um, the marginal 
uh, likelihood, right? Then you can basically realize that the log of product equals to sum of log and then separate out terms. So the important idea here is to notice that this log PD, the model evidence or marginal likelihood, or log marginal likelihood um, is a constant with respect to the parameters of the Q distribution. So this basically means that, you know, for the sake of um, optimizing Q distribution, this mar marginal likelihood term uh, is irrelevant, right? So that means you can just basically throw it away. <laughs> Right to and then rewrite it as a equivalent uh, optimization problem. So in other words, minimizing KR divergence from the Q distribution to the inside posterior is equivalent to maximizing what is strong here, and it has a name called evidence lower bound or elbow. So the picture is like this. Okay, so uh, you have the relationship here between the uh, divergence and the elbow, and it tells you that uh, first elbow is a lower bound of the uh, marginal uh, log marginal likelihood, and second, the gap between uh, these two things is the KL divergence that you want to minimize. So it means that okay, you can if you can push up the lower bound, right? And remember that the log marginal likelihood has nothing to do with the Q, so that it always stays there, right? Then essentially you are also minimizing the KR divergence and which is the thing that you want to do. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So there are other ways to derive this KR, to, to derive this elbow by using Jensen's inequality, but I think this is a uh, nice picture to actually show uh, what's actually happening and why uh, uh, you can use uh, elbow as a way to uh, apply a proximal posterior. Okay, so remember previously we said that uh, we want to uh, define a class of Q distribution, right? And then uh, try to figure out the best answer in that. So um, roughly speaking, uh, in a pictorial way, right? The um, uh, version inference procedure is basically trying to figure out a projection of the posterior distribution, which is often outside of the uh, Q family, right? To the best answer, in this Q family. So this is a picture that uh, maybe uh, you can keep in mind what's happening. Okay, so I think, so this, uh, um, this is the elbow, but in a different uh, form. So it is still equivalent to what we've seen before, but I think this is a form that is more relevant uh, in our case that uh, you can basically uh, rewrite the elbow by noticing again, like log of product equal to sum of log. So this uh, makes the elbow uh, to have two terms. So the first term is the expected log likelihood of the parameters given data, okay? And uh, usually speaking, you can think about this as you know, similar to the uh, data loss that you often use like um, gross entropy and the L2 loss, right? Except that uh, you're going to compute it under the expectation of the Q distribution. And in practice, this is uh, often estimated by Monte Carlo. So there is an extra, extra term comparing to the usual deep learning uh, method, right? So there is this term of KL divergence from the approximate posterior to the prior distribution. Okay, so um, you can think about it as a, uh, in some sense, regularizer of the Q distribution, right? So um, in quite some cases that uh, we want to use, say, an uninformative prior to basically reflect that we know nothing, uh, right, about the uh, parameters, or you know, in some cases we do know something, right, then we can use the informative prior. So what this KR term does is that it tries to, you know, regularize the Q distribution so that it still, you know, maintains some behavior that you want uh, for the prior. And I think this is actually quite desirable in the sense that, you know, if you have a test input that is very, very different from uh, the uh, training input that you've seen, then it's essentially you have um, much less idea about what's going on and you rather prefer to go back to the prior behavior. And that is a term how it is achieved by the uh, KR regressor. 
Okay, so I hope the inversion inference framework is clear to you. Uh, sorry that maybe you have heard about this for many, many times the, during this summer school. But let me repeat again what is uh, relevant to us today. So yes, yeah, so three steps for approximate inference in Bayesian neural networks. Figure out a parametric family of the Q distribution that you want to get the best approximation in. Find that best approximation using some objective function. And today we're going to use version inference. Okay, and then after that, in prediction time, compute the uh, predictive distribution with Monte Carlo approximation methods. Okay, so these are basically the three steps that uh, perhaps if you don't get anything from uh, today's uh, technical uh, stuff, then conceptually this is a good framework to remember. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more in detail in terms of how we actually implement one of them. And uh, we are going to do mean field version inference. So what is mean field version inference, right? So mean field refers to the type of distribution that you are going to choose. And it means that we are going to ignore the correlations between the entries of theta and assume a completely factorized approximation to it. Okay, so the, basically this equation is mean field. Okay, so on top of mean field, right, you still need to define a um, parametric form of each of the Q distribution for each of the weights or each of the bias uh, uh, elements, right? So in this case, we are going to use Gaussian distribution uh, with some mean and some variance. And we do the same thing for the bias. And this is essentially the uh, factorized, uh, fully factorized Gaussian approximation or mean field Gaussian approximation. Okay, so now in this case, the uh, variational parameter, right, for the Q distribution are going to be the mean and the variance of the Q distribution, but just bear in mind that you need to make sure that the variance of a Gaussian distribution is non-negative, right? So you are not, we are not going to directly parameterize it. So you will, uh, you will get some exercise on this, okay? Good. So we've parameterized a Q distribution with some parameters, and now we're going to basically uh, figure out the best variational parameters. So uh, as we discussed before, uh, we are going to uh, use variational inference to find those optimal variational parameters for which we are going to maximize the following elbow objective that we've just seen from uh, a few slides ago. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about in practice how you actually uh, implement it, right? So you need to implement both terms, the uh, data uh, likelihood term and also the KL term. Okay, so um, first um, for neural networks, we definitely want to apply it to large data sets, right? Which basically means that we would like to use, you know, uh, optimization techniques like stochastic gradient descent. So this is definitely amenable to uh, the elbow because uh, you can basically uh, use the IID assumption of the likelihood term, right? To break the log uh, uh, P of D given theta into a sum of the likelihood terms on each of the data points, right? And then now you can basically use a mini batch estimate for this log P D given theta by get, just getting a mini batch and then do the uh, right reweighting. And when we say right reweighting, it's basically re refers to this term. Okay, so, you, so this is actually important term in the sense that first, you need to make sure that you have the right data count. And because you can think about uh, the basic paradigm that having more data, hopefully, will make your posterior shrink towards uh, some uh, certainty for some answer, right? And you know, this shrink, shrinking posterior definitely depends on the number of data points you have. So the end part here will be important, okay? So uh, the big M here is essentially the uh, size of your mini batch, and this is needed for a Monte Carlo estimate. Okay, so this is the trick for uh, stochastic optimization or uh, SGD. Okay, so, uh, but still we need to compute the expectation of the data likelihood term for each of the data, right? And the expectation is under the Q distribution, uh, which does not have any solutions. So instead, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, do what is called Monte Carlo sampling or Monte Carlo estimate by uh, getting some samples 
from the Q distribution, right? And then uh, um, compute the estimate of this expectation using the empirical average. Okay, so in practice, how do we do that, right? So at least for, uh, for a lot of distributions like Yaoxian, there is this thing called the re-parametrization trick um, that you can use to do this, okay? So for Gaussian, sampling a Gaussian distribution with some mean and some variance is equivalent to first sampling a uh, standard Gaussian noise term, epsilon, right? And then scale it up and then shift it, uh, right? Using the corresponding uh, mean and the standard deviation parameters of your Q distribution. So that's how you actually get the uh, theta from, uh, samples from the Q distribution. So why do we want to do this, right? So um, the reason here is that, uh, you know, um, why you want to estimate the expectation of the log likelihood term, because you actually want to use it to compute gradients, right, of the uh, version of parameters and then optimize it. So this uh, reparametrization trick provides you a, a very convenient way to do so in the sense that uh, you can basically see that uh, uh, the uh, loss function or the objective is computed using this sample, right? And this sample is attached directly to the parameters you want to optimize. So in the back prop um, um, space, right? So you are going to compute a bunch of say chain rules, right? Uh, through these uh, connections in red, and that's how what is happening happening in the uh, back end of, let's say, uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow. Okay, so there are other ways to estimate the gradients, but uh, this reparameterization trick is the, I would say, uh, uh, one of the most convenient way to program these things up. Okay, so uh, yeah, we combine both of the steps, right? So first you want to get a mini batch from the data set. And then you're also going to estimate the uh, data uh, likelihood term with multi color samples. And here you can use reparameterization trick. So for the KL term, right? So um, if we are using Gaussian prior for P and the Gaussian approximation for Q, right? Then there is an analytic solution for this KL term. So that directly depends on the mean and variance of the Q distribution. So you can just compute it. But in the case that you are going to use, let's say, non Gaussian prior or non Gaussian approximations, right? So uh, this KL term can also be intractable. So you can, but you can still estimate it with Monte Carlo. So it is still quite convenient. So just to give you some examples of the likelihood terms you can, you can use, right? So in regression, we often assume that the uh, likelihood term is Gaussian. So you will have a uh, Gaussian likelihood for uh, the uh, for here. And for uh, classification, as I said at the beginning, that uh, the negation of the cross entropy loss is equivalent to the law probability of a categorical distribution. So this is what we are going to use in classification case. Okay, so yeah, so we've done two steps, right? Find, uh, uh, defining a class of distribution for the Q distribution and then uh, figure out how to optimize the parameters for Q, right? So the next, the last step is, as I said, in prediction, you just get samples from the Q distribution, uh, get a bunch of them to parameterize a, bu a bunch of different neural networks run forward passes for those neural networks and average results. And in particular for Gaussians, right? So you can still use these kind of say the uh, sampling uh, trick for the Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, to get the uh, theta K samples from the Q distribution. So I'm hope, I'm hope this is clear for you. So it is uh, a good time for you to ask questions because uh, I'm going to give you a five minutes break. And after this break, uh, we are going to come back and actually do some implementation exercise, okay? Okay, so we are almost uh, time. But I mean, so since later on, it's going to be, uh, as, uh, say, programming exercises that uh, we are happy to answer your questions right away. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Yes. So um, essentially, so in the, this part of the tutorial, we are going to implement some the, the methods that we just mentioned. Uh, mean field version inference in basic neural networks, but in this simpler case of NLP. Okay, so we are going to do some uh, regression example, and we are going to have a case study on basic optimization with basic neural networks and see how it works. 
Okay, so yeah, um, I think uh, maybe in the GitHub repo of this summer school, they already uh, uh, provided the link, but if you don't have it, right? So go to this link, okay? So this is a Google Colab uh, notebook. The way you're going to use it is you should make your own copy. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping that you, you all have Google account. Um, okay, uh, make your own copy of uh, this notebook and then uh, play around uh, in the, the demo using uh, the collab lab, um, thing you have. Okay, so uh, let me see. Okay. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, maybe let me show the uh, uh, link again before I actually show this. Um, yeah, since other people are also coming back. Okay. Uh, yes, go to this link. Okay, or the, you can find the link uh, on the GitHub repo uh, in our proper AI. Okay, so yeah, so this is a Google uh, Collect notebook. So you should make your own copy. Okay, and then play around uh, in uh, the uh, Google Collab account uh, you have. I hope everyone has the uh, Google account. Okay, so. Um, So this is what you should see. Okay, so what do you actually see here? Uh, can you, okay, yes, you, you do see the, uh, uh, the tutorial here, right? So um, the way it works is um, there are a bunch of codes that I prepared that uh, you don't need to worry too much about it. Although if you're interested in how they look like, you can definitely have a look. But the important bit is to look at, uh, I'm trying to figure out where is the mouse. Oh, yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Now it works. Okay. Yes. So the important bit here is that uh, there are a bunch of things, but uh, you can basically see. Um, yes. So there is this thing called beginning of your code. Okay. So this is the part that you are supposed to fill in your own code. Okay. So uh, my hope is that uh, if you can make uh, say the uh, right implementation of uh, the methods that you're asked to implement in many of these slots. Then once you complete that and then you run the uh, cor corresponding code blocks of this notebook, then it will basically just work straight away and then you, will, you can see some results. Okay, so uh, we do have a few TAs around to uh, help you in, in case you have any questions. So um, yeah, so um, I think we can actually spend like um, uh, 15 minutes, 15, okay, 15 minutes uh, on this uh, tutorial until the part of... Um, Yeah, there are a bunch of things that I implement. You don't need to worry too much about. Yes, until the part of using other Q distributions. Okay, so uh, yes, so let's spend fifteen minutes on this. If you have any questions, you just raise your hand, and uh, myself or one of the TAs will come and reach out to you. Okay, so um, I think uh, we've got uh, fifteen minutes uh, passed. I hope many of you have at least get some part uh, through it. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. 
Okay, as I said, these uh, uh, tutorial answers, notebooks are definitely uh, there on GitHub, but uh, let me try to explain what's happening. Okay, so um, in this mean field version inference example, right? So uh, the idea of this code base is the following, that uh, we are trying to, you know, do something similar to NN.linear that some of you might already be very familiar with if you use PyTorch. So, you know, if you can actually construct these kind of layers, right, then you can basically stack uh, uh, layers just like you start the usual deterministic neural network layers together and then get a uh, near a basic neural network constructed right straight away okay so yeah that's basically why we are interested in implementing uh mean field version inference uh, for one basic neural network layer okay so i okay so in this exercise i think there are a bunch of things that i ask you to implement right okay so the first thing is essentially the uh, parameterization of the Q distribution. So we are using Gaussian distribution, which means we want to compute the mean and the variance of the Gaussian distribution. But as I said before, that uh, you need to make sure that the variance of the Gaussian uh, is always non-negative, which means uh, it's better not to directly parameterize the variance. Rather, you want to parameterize something first and then transform it into some positive value and then use that value as the variance of standard deviation. And that's essentially what we um, do here. So you can basically see that, okay, so this uh, underscore weight uh, STD param is essentially that kind of free form parameters that um, uh, we are going to uh, optimize, right? So um, in this case, I'm actually parameterizing the logarithm of the standard deviation. Okay, so you can basically see that the way you get it to work is essentially, so you parameterize it with some uh, initializations. And in this case, uh, I parameterize it in, the, in a way uh, such that it is initialized by the logarithm of some specified initialization for the standard deviation for Q. I will explain that the choice of this data Okay, so yes, yeah, so once you parameterize this, right, then uh, yes, when you, want, when you want to get the variance or standard deviation of the Q distribution, then essentially you just apply the uh, exponent function to transform this uh, free form parameter into a non-negative value. So this is how you make sure that the uh, variance or the standard deviation of your Q distribution is always non-negative. There are some clamping op uh, operation here to just make sure that you don't have problems of numerical instability. So this is a us the usual thing that uh, uh, you need to do if you are dealing with many of the uh, approximate inference or Bayesian inference uh, and computations, okay? So yeah, so this is the uh, parameterization of the Q distribution parameters and initialization, okay? So the second thing we ask you to implement is essentially the forward pass. How are you going to compute the predictions? And you know, these are also going to be used in the objective function that you're going to use to train the Q distribution, right? So uh, as we explained in the previous uh, lecture that uh, um, you need to get samples from the Q distribution. And we are, since we are using Gaussian distribution, there is this uh, rule of uh, first sampling a, uh, 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 mean zero standard deviation one noise. And in this case, this is the function in PyTorch that uh, you're going to use, okay? And uh, once you've got get this uh, uh, noise samples, then you just you know, scale it up with the right standard deviation and um, shift it with the mean. So this is how you actually get the samples, right? So you can basically see that the forward pass is uh, not too different from the forward pass that you usually see in, Py, uh, in PyTorch. And this basically explains why I reuse quite a lot of functions uh, in PyTorch heavily. The only difference is essentially, yes, you get weights and bias, right? For example, from your Q distribution, and then you just uh, pass forward using PyTorch uh, 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 native forward pass function, okay? So I think this is the uh, convenient way to do that because you can actually extend this principle to any other uh, uh, implementation of neural networks. So essentially the sort of like the heavy lifting work by say complicated neural network computations are done if you can uh, quote the right uh, PyTorch function like f dot linear or f dot uh, uh, attention or whatever, right? You just call them. But essentially when you need to supply the weights, 
you just you know um compute the weight samples and then supply those sample weights to the, the, those kind of PyTorch functions and that's uh, essentially at least right now how I implement uh, uh, basic neural networks with PyTorch. I guess you can do the similar things for uh, TensorFlow or JAX. Yes. Right, yes. Okay, good question. So the question is, where do I apply for the mean field assumption? Okay, so you can basically see that, okay, so this is, you need to define the virtual parameters of the Q distribution, right? So this means I need to find the mean and some parameters of the variance where I do get the, uh, say, the variance out, right? So if you notice that uh, the way I define the, uh, uh, the, okay, I'm trying to see where is it. Yes, the way I define this, how to say the uh, underscore weight STD prom, right? It actually has the same shape as the mean, right? I mean, if you're actually going to use, let's say, full covariance, right, then it should have even bigger size. So this is essentially telling you that I'm going to use mean field. And it can also be reflected in this uh, sample. Uh, the uh, 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 forward pass. And in fact, later on, you will actually see a sort of like a full covariance matrix one. In, in that case, you actually see the way you get samples are different. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Okay, great. So this is uh, how you actually implement uh, the uh, parameters of the Q distribution and also how to compute the, the forward pass. So uh, I'm basically use some in the functions provided in PyTorch, so that makes the KL diverse computation very convenient. The other important stuff is you need to implement the elbow, right? To uh, get the objective and then uh, use um, optimize this objective to get the Q distribution. So um, this is the function to implement the uh, elbow objective, right? So um, in fact, because um, PyTorch works with uh, minimization rather than uh, maximization, you need to implement the negation of elbow or variational free energy, as you heard from the quiz. So um, this case, uh, you need to compute the, the negative log likelihood of the data. So there is this data uh, loss function that uh, uh, is essentially the Gaussian uh, likelihood. So essentially, you just can uh, figure out uh, on maybe, for example, say Wikipedia, that what is the form of the Gaussian distribution, take the log of it, and then, uh, and then uh, implement it used, uh, here for this uh, Gaussian likelihood. Okay, so this is the Gaussian likelihood. And uh, um, negation of it will be the uh, loss function. So yeah, so you compute the loss function for this, and then you compute the KL divergence for which I already provide you a function here. And now, because you know we already compute the mean, right, for this mini batch estimate, so that explains you already have this kind of say big M in the denominator for the uh, scaling factors that we see in the slides, right? But I also mentioned that you need to make sure that you have the right data count. So that explains why you have this N data, which is the total number of data points scaling for this negative log IQ term. Okay, so um, the interesting bit here is there is this beta term. Okay, so there's a beta uh, uh, times KL stuff. So this is the practical trick that uh, people use in basic neural networks, but, but also maybe in, let's say, VAEs as well, to uh, make this optimization work um, in practice. So I would encourage you to try out different beta parameter, uh, beta values in the uh, later blocks and see what happens. Okay, very good. So one thing I want to mention here is essentially this prediction function, right? You can basically see that I basically run this basic neural networks for multiple times. And uh, this basic neural networks forward uh, pass because in the previous implementation, right, already includes the sampling step. This basically means that whenever you call this BNN function, you are going to sample a different set of parameters or different sets of weight. Okay, so that explains how you actually get, let's say, a multiple samples and then do multiple forward passes and then get uh, uh, the average. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we implement this, right? So now um, um, there is this testing in terms of a simple uh, regression task. 
Okay, so we basically just get some data and we visualize it. So uh, the ground truth function is some interesting mix uh, of uh, periodic and uh, uh, monotonic linear increasing behavior. So this is the ground truth function that I made up for that. And uh, the observation are uh, shown in the uh, red dots. Okay, so this is the ground truth. So now we want to fit a uh, basic neural network to it. So we basically just initialize it with, uh, I think in this case, two hidden layers. You can try other number of layers and then you can change uh, the uh, activation function uh, to whatever you like, right? And then specify the hyperparameters that you want. Okay, so um, basically if you plot, what is uh, happening after initialization, right? So this is something at least what I got, what I've got when I run this uh, block of code. So it looks a little bit strange in the sense that you know when we say we want to parameterize things, we want to put a prior or say a wide prior on it. You kind of expect it to see that you want to see some sort of say a broad uh, range of uncertainty, right? But just to note that here we are showing the initialization of the uh, uh, basic neural network and compute these things under the Q distribution. So we initialize the Q distributions. Uh, standard deviation with a pretty small value. And this explains why you have this narrow uh, uh, result uh, at the beginning, but don't worry. So uh, once you fit the network, it will become better. So um, uh, we can talk about why we cho choose to do things in this way uh, later. Okay, so yeah. So we initialize the network and then we train the network. Uh, for a few iterations, but well, I would say try, uh, fit the Q distribution for a few iterations, right? So, and then, so you can basically plot what's happening in terms of like the uh, elbow and specifically you can plot the two terms in the elbow, right? The first one is essentially the data uh, negative log likelihood term shown on the left hand side that you can basically see it is definitely decreasing and start to fit the data well, but you know, at the end of the day, it uh, starts to uh, um, flatten out. So, in terms of the KR divergence, which is a regularization term, right? Because we started from very small uh, variance of the Q distribution, so that the KR is actually very, very big at the beginning. So you can basically see why this is still, you know, decreasing for a lot of uh, 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 iterations, even after two uh, uh, two uh, thousand epoch. Okay, so um, if you initialize the uh, uh, network, sorry, if you initialize the uh, Q distribution with some other um, parameters, then you will see some other different behavior. So let me show you. Okay, so, okay. So let's just try this, okay? So, Right, interesting. Um, oh, okay. I need. I do need to run all the things at the beginning. Sorry. Um, Yes. So if you so you see, if you actually change another initialization, right, uh, of the standard deviation to some bigger value, I just increase the value by ten times. Okay. So then you basically see added initialization. Then the Q distribution is uh, giving you very wide uh, prediction. So notice notice the scale is very different here. Okay. So now if you actually try to fit this uh, uh, Q distribution starting from this initialization. Okay, just wait a moment and see what happens. Mm -hmm.
Great. Okay, so this is what you see. Okay, so essentially, you can basically see that uh, if you look, if you inspect the two uh, terms in the elbow, right? So essentially, the term, the first term for the uh, data likelihood, that somehow that reflects how well your network fits the data, tells you, okay, I'm not fitting the data at all because it is oscillating at the very large magnitude, but your KL is, I mean, the second thing here is you can see that KL is increasing, right? So uh, I, I think if you inspect uh, further, it's the increasing is because you can show that uh, the variance of the Q distribution is going to shrink because you actually want to feed the data. So if you actually now plot what is happening for the prediction, okay, so this is what you get. Okay, so you know, uh, I think this is one of the bitter lessons that uh, we learn by uh, running these things in practice. That first, initialization of the uh, Q distribution does matter. Okay, so okay, let me just go back to the nicer region and. <laughs> Yeah, so you so you need to initialize it very carefully to at least make sure that uh, uh, at the beginning of the training you can actually feed the data reasonably well. Yeah, so this is what you see in terms of uh, when you actually uh, start uh, uh, from a uh, better initialization of the Q distribution, uh, what is the pretty distribution look like? Okay, so um, I can say a little bit more about the behavior of what uh, the mean field are beating uh, here, but you can also play around, right? So here I include a list of things that you can play around by uh, you know, using different activation functions or change the depth or of the or width of the network and then you know use some other parameters and you will actually see that those are the things that are really uh, you know makes the behavior looks different i mean we just uh, saw the example of using different initialization right so other things that they also give you a pretty interesting result so um i think the general thing that uh, i want to comment on um mean field version inference here is for sure, at least here for these kind of say gen, uh, generalized ELU or you know, the activation function is actually quite close to value. At least for these kind of activation functions, uh, in terms of fitting mean field uh, approximation, you don't see the kind of like uh, sausage plot uh, results like what I'll know referred uh, on Wednesday, right? So in, if you use Gaussian process, and in this case, you can definitely see that there are gaps of data that has missing uh, values, right? So you were, in forgetting process, you should see some interesting sausage plots here and here, but this is not happening uh, for mean field version inference. So um, there are, some, I mean, there are papers that try to analyze this uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, including our work. I'm not going to talk about today. If you're interested in, just come and ask me uh, offline. But uh, this is uh, usually what you get. Uh, for mean field version inference if we are working on a regression problem. So yeah, it, it gives you some uncertainty estimates, right? But uh, um, I, I mean, for me, it's a little bit difficult to tell whether, you know, this is the behavior that uh, I really want for some particular uh, applications. I mean, for some applications, it's fine, but for some other applications like basic optimizations, you might want something more, okay? So yes. Um, so this is mean field uh, uh, version inference. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about other Q distributions and then we can have another try on this, okay? Wait a moment, I'm, I'm going to uh, pull up uh, the slides. Oh, okay. I'm not sharing screen anymore. Or um, okay. 
Yes, okay. So um, we just discussed uh, mean field variation inference, and I hope you have some uh, hands on feeling on it. Okay, so um, there are definitely questions in terms of whether mean field version inference is good enough, and I definitely get questions also, you know, during the break on this, right? So now it's the time to discuss whether we want to actually use more complicated Q distributions, right? Because, you know, in the first sight, if you think about the posterior of neural network weights, where the neural network weights is actually very high dimensional, right? You would kind of think that the posterior is highly non-Gaussian and also may have a lot of different modes. So that means, you know, a mean field Gaussian approximation, which only has one mode and ignore all the correlations in the weights, might be a very poor approximation. And indeed, so, but the main issue of trying to use more complicated Q distribution is the following, right? So, um, the hope is that you want to get more flexible approximations so that somehow you can get a better approximate uh, posterior. So I put a question mark there, which is basically telling you that uh, in practice, it is a Quite, quite complicated depending on the choice of your uh, Q family and also the optimization algorithm itself. Okay, but the more important issue here is essentially, if you're going to use more complicated Q distribution, for example, say Gaussians with a full covariance matrix, then you are going to have a higher time and space complexity well, in terms of computation for the posterior. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, slow computation of the exact posterior is the first reason why we want to resort to approximate inference. So this basically means that uh, whenever you want to think about, let's say, uh, posterior approximations, right? Apart from thinking about whether the uh, Q distribution can actually capture the behavior of the, or the, the, the most important behavior of the exact posterior you want, you should also think very carefully in terms of what is the price of computation that you want to pay, okay? So, um, okay. So um, in the next uh, few uh, minutes, we are going to look at two alternatives. So the first one is called what we call last layer basic neural network, uh, which is essentially full covariance Gaussian approximations for the last layer only. And the second uh, solution is a Monte Carlo dropout, which is uh, sort of like easy in, in to implement, but actually gets you, you know, a quick uncertainty estimate uh, uh, from uh, neural networks. Okay. So this is what I mean by last layer based neural network. And essentially you can think about it in a way that uh, for the first, until the second last layer, we are still going to use deterministic neural network. Okay. But then we are, uh, for the very last layer of the neural network, we are going to make it Bayesian and then use uh, a Gaussian approximation to the posterior. And in this case, the Gaussian approximation is going to have a, a uh, full covariance matrix. I think this is probably uh, the, the sort of like the uh, price that we can pay maybe at most, because if you think about the complexity of parametrizing a covariance matrix, right? So think about a layer of neural network uh, as having the number of parameters as the, the input dimension times the output dimension, right? Then if you actually want a covariance matrix in full rank, then you need the number of input dimensions squared times the dimension of output square parameters. And to actually get samples from uh, this Q distribution, you need to pay a computation cost of input, of input dimension cubic times output dimension cubic. Even that the fact that usually right now we use neural networks of let's say hundreds of, or even thousands of hidden units, Clearly, you, you, we cannot pay this price for every layer, and that's basically why, the, usually speaking, if you do this kind of say uh, uh, better Gaussian approximation, either you use uh, low rank uh, uh, or covariance matrix with some clever techniques, but or you are, you're going to do that only for the last layer. So, in the regression domain, uh, if you think about it, that uh, uh, it is actually equivalent to doing Bayesian linear regression, but with input features computed using some you know, neural network transformations. And that neural network transformation corresponds to the network uh, for a pass until the second last layer. So that means if you are going to do, uh, say, um, 
batch training, which means that you are going to not you, you are going to uh, use the full batch instead of mini batches, right? Then you can actually get the uh, uh, the analytic solutions for these uh, mean and the COVID variance matrix parameter. But in practice, uh, we want to use mini batch uh, gradient. And also we want to uh, extend this idea to classification as well, right? So that means we are still going to use uh, elbow. And in this case, you know, the elbow still has this first data like we term, but the sampling procedure for the Q distribution is going to change that uh, for the first uh, layers until the second last, you are going to use the deterministic weights. And then you, you only sample the uh, weights in the last layer. Okay, so for the chaos, right? As we discussed that we are only going to uh, use Bayesian treatment for the very last layer, then the chaos only applies to the very last layer. Okay, I hope this is clear. Yes. Okay, very interesting question. So the question here is why we uh, specifically choose to use the last layer. Um, I think you can definitely use it for the other layers if you can pay the price. As I mentioned, that the cost of parameterizing this full covariance Gaussian is like squared in terms of the input times output dimensions and cubic in terms of uh, input and times the output dimensions. So in the hidden layers, right, usually you will have the like hundreds of hidden units for the before layer and hundreds of hidden units for the output layer. You figure out what is the price you're going to pay. Okay. So I'm, doing, I'm just saying that this is a uh, more economic solution not necessarily like the best in terms of like the uh, expressibility of the q distribution but it's more uh, economic okay very good so um another way to make it more economic is to do what is called the monte carlo dropout or nc dropouts coming from this uh ic paper from yari Gao and zooming money okay so um the idea is even simpler so uh we don't worry about you know actually explicitly parameterizing the distribution for the weights and biases and instead we just insert uh, in dropout layers okay and then uh, perform dropout during training and testing, and especially during testing, right? So the usual way people use dropout is they want to turn off dropout uh, in test time and do some sort of sick, uh, uh, adjustment for that. But in this MC dropout paradigm, that you also want to turn on dropout um, uh, in test time, and actually you want to compute the multiple forward passes of the network with dropout turn on and then average over the result. Okay, so the uh, reason for that is by doing this kind of multiple forward passes with dropout, you are actually implicitly sampling the uh, um, the Q distribution of the parameters, and there is an implicit definition of the Q distribution. Okay, so here is what's happening. Okay, so um, there are some interesting theoretical issues for dropout, but essentially what's uh, going on here is dropout, MC dropout is using a mixture of two Gaussian distribution uh, and then take the limits of the Gaussian distribution in terms of the variance. Okay, so you can basically see that so pi here is the dropout rate you are going to specify, right? And then the Q distribution is going to have be a mixture of the two Gaussians where one of them is centered at zero and another one is centered at some parameters you're going to specify. This is the actual mean parameters for these other components. And the variance here is going to be some uh, some fixed parameter. And then in practice, uh, because you're going to make it uh, goes to zero, right? Then you can somehow, somehow just ignore it and then think about it as mixture of two delta of delta distributions, okay? So um, let's see what's happening in terms of sampling procedure, right? So, you know, um, there are two ways that you can implement MC dropout where you are going to do that uh, right later, okay? So if you know the distribution form of the of the queue where this is a mixture of Gaussian, right? Then for sure, you can actually do something in a weight space by, you know, uh, yeah, drop out some rows in this case. Right, but if you think about it, so if you are actually going to say uh, drop out some rows in the weight and then compute the forward passes, right, then it corresponds to dropping out the corresponding uh, output unit. Okay, so this is essentially uh, how you can actually implement these sort of like uh, forward passes 
in an implicit way so that uh, you directly compute the uh, four paths with the mean parameter here, right? And then drop out the corresponding units. So these two things, these two uh, computations are equivalent. Okay, I think this is the interesting bit that maybe you may want to uh, 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 learn and try about it. And there are some, uh, I mean, although the computations, uh, the results are equivalent, there are some cases that you will actually prefer to use this one. You will see later, okay. Yes, okay. So now let's go for another part of the tutorial. Um, we are not going to do a... Uh, 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 last layer BNN because I already implemented it for you. You can just run it, okay? But uh, as I said, we can implement MC dropout in two different ways. So uh, let's have another, um, say, 10 minutes, okay? Uh, or, or five minutes to basically implement the MC dropout and then you run it, okay? And then compare with multi with uh, mean field version inference. Okay, so... Well, I guess I think I'm way too ambitious in terms of uh, uh, going through these exercises, but let's see how much we can go for. Okay, so, uh, right, yes, okay. So um, I'm hoping that you, you could run this um, last layer based neural network yourself because I have implemented it for you. But the important thing you, you, you might notice is that the, the way we implement the variance of the Q distribution is different from what we did before because we actually need to parameterize the uh, covariance matrix and make sure that the covariance matrix is positive semi-definite. Okay, so that means instead of parameterizing that uh, covariance uh, uh, directly, we are going to parameterize its uh, Cholesky factor. Okay. So that's essentially what we are doing. So we are based, so for the Cholesky factor, you also need to make sure that the diagonals are non-negative, right? And then we also basically just apply the previous trick that you're trying to parameterize non-negative uh, uh, values, right? To first parameterize some free parameter and then transform it to the uh, non-negative things using say exponent. Yes, yeah, so or using some other so, soft plus is another a function that you can transform it uh, to a non negative values, but that's essentially what happens here. Okay, and if you look at how you actually get samples, right? So the samples here is no longer like say uh, just element wise, uh, element wise uh, product of the noise and the standard deviation, and instead you actually need to do the proper uh, matrix modifications. Okay, so yeah, so this is what's happening. And uh, if you run this, okay. So yeah, so this is all the things that I previously run. Uh, so this is the result that you you will get for the uh, last layer approximations. So I would say that you can see that uh, even uh, even if uh, even now we are only using the approximations only for the last layer, you see something quite qualitatively similar. Right to what is happening in the mean field version inference, and uh, if uh, uh, offline you do the maps to calculate the amount of parameters or the, the amount of version parameters you are you are you are using for mean field version inference versus this last layer Bayesian neural network, you will actually see uh, see that this last layer uh, Bayesian neural network is actually using fewer number of version parameters comparing to the mean field version inference. Okay. So this is uh, what's happening here. So for MC dropout, right? As I mentioned that uh, it is a mixture of two delta distributions. So, okay, so let me see. Yeah, so I asked you to implement this forward pass, right? So there are two forward passes I explained, they are equivalent, right? So uh, this is the forward pass that if you're going to directly sample from weights, right? Then you're going to first sample a mask, and then use this mask to basically mask out some rows or maybe I should say some columns I don't I, I don't know but essentially you get the idea right you're going to mask out some rows in the weights and then use that weight to do the uh, forward pass so it is equivalent to uh, basically just you know do forward pass with the mean parameter right and then uh, drop out the <laughs> units okay so uh, yeah if you run this result right uh, yeah, this is all the plots, and this is essentially what you will get with uh, 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 MC dropout. Okay, so it's a figure that looks uh, maybe a little bit nicer in terms of, you know, if you are really uh, a big fan of uh, sausage plot. 
So, <laughs> so yes, it looks a little bit uh, uh, closer to the associative plots that you, you might want. Okay. So the interesting bit here is if you look at this function here, right? So I tell you that you should actually set the dropout mode when you plot this function in terms of like using the drop weights approach instead of dropping units. Okay, so the reason here is that if you want to actually plot functions, you need to make sure, make sure that the functions values you are plotting are coherent. So let's see what happens if you actually don't do things in that way. Okay, you need to train a little bit uh, longer, but uh, uh, it, it will be very fast. Okay, very good. Okay, so yes, let's let's train this. Okay, so I I switch it uh, to the mode of dropping units and then do operation. Okay, so collectively speaking, you still see some sausage plots, but definitely way noisier so you might thought um, once you see this plot you might thought oh maybe the underlying uh distribution are actually this noisy but why this is happening is because for different uh, location in this plot that you are evaluating the mean and uh, the, the the function value and its uncertainty you are actually using a different dropout mask right and because of the equivalence of using dropout mask in the uh uh unit space versus the uh, uh, weight space. Essentially, it means that if you're using different uh, dropout masks for the units, you are using different dropout masks for the weights, which basically means that for different locations, you are actually sample a different function value. Okay, it means that, for example, like the, the, fun the functions you are actually evaluating here is not the same function you are evaluating here because you are using different weight samples. So that explains why you have this interesting... Uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> weekly behavior of the plot but this is not because the the, the underlying uncertainty is looks like this weekly thing is basically just because you 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 you, you are not using the, the consistent function samples all the way along okay yes so okay so the way okay if you look at how this is implemented okay So the dropout mask here, you can see that this is a picking, picking random uh, Bernoulli samples, right? And it can be different for different inputs. But here, it is only dropout mask for the weights. Once you sample one weight, it's going to be applied to all the inputs. Okay, you use the same weight for all the inputs, which means that at one time, you are evaluating the same function for that particular set of inputs which is not the case for dropping units. Yes. Yeah, so you can. So that basically means that you actually need to make sure that uh, the dropout mask, the mask here are the same, right? For across all the, uh, uh, the units uh, for different inputs, right? But uh, the, okay, so it's a little bit technical, right? But the reason why you often want to use different dropout mask for different uh, inputs is if you're going to use uh, it to estimate the uh, gradient of the elbow, it's going to have a lower variance. So that will basically speed up the training a lot. So this is a technical uh, point. Okay, so um, given the time, I think we can basically run through basic optimization and see what, uh, uh, how much time we can uh, have. Okay, so um, in Bayesian optimization, basically the task you want to solve is essentially you want to basically uh, find the maximum of some function F0. 
Okay, so if you actually know the form of F0, let's say it is a quadratic function, right? Then essentially you can apply whatever tools or transition tools that you like the most to find this optimal solution like gradient, gradient ascent and the Newton's method. But in many other cases, you don't actually know the uh, functional form of uh, F0. For example, if F0 corresponds to sort of like a pretty complicated simulator, or it corresponds to, let's say, doing some experiment and you need, actually need to wait for some time to collect the experimental results, right? Then you don't actually have the identity form for this F0. So uh, you cannot directly apply this gradient descent or uh, Newton's method to find the local uh, maximum. Okay, so how, what do we do in this case? Well, I mean, the first idea is very straightforward, right? So yes, we don't have the uh, identity form for this underlying function F0, then why not just try to fit a parametric function to it, right? So you collect some data from this black box. Once you've got some data, you fit a neural network to it. And this neural network uh, will, will have some parametric form F theta. So uh, then you can basically just run your favorite automation methods on it to figure out the uh, local maximum for it. Okay, so this is the uh, first step, but it has some problems. Okay, so first it means that, you know, uh, in order to fit the uh, function well, you need to collect quite a, a big amount of uh, data points for accurate fitting of F theta. So this might not be, uh, say, uh, cheap if, as I said, your F0 function corresponds to uh, some expensive experiment in, say, chemistry or biology. Okay, so uh, that definitely uh, counts up with cost. And also at the same time, uh, if your black box will return noisy values, right? Then if you actually overfit to the noisy output with neural networks, then your neural networks were going to have sort of like a pretty non-smooth behavior that will change the locations of local minimum or local maximum. So that's the uh, local maximum you get from say, uh, maximizing the surrogate function will not be the local maximum that you actually want for F0. Okay, so that's the first point. So the second point is definitely for sure that uh, 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 if you only do uh, fitting with the deterministic neural network, then you are not taking uncertainty into uh, considerations. And in practice, you know, even if you say the evaluation cost of the black box is very, very cheap, there is no way for you to get infinite amount of data. You always get finite amount of data, which means that you always have locations that you've never observed values. So you never know whether there will be local minimum around, right? So you need to take uncertainty into account. Okay, so that brings to the idea of Bayesian optimization. So sorry, this is not the exhaustive plot, but let me uh, explain what's happening. Okay, so um, as we said that uh, we want to basically, you know, uh, solve this problem with fewer samples from the black box. And also we want to take uncertainty into account. So basically, basic optimization is finishing this loop. So the idea is the following. So uh, you start from uh, a very small amount of observations and this uh, amount of observations will, be, will help you to build a Bayesian model that gives you the current belief of what the function looks like and its uncertainty estimates. So this is shown in uh, here in blue. Okay, so once you've got that, you define some kind of acquisition function or some way that take uncertainty into account to propose the next point that you want to send into the black box to collect data. Okay, so you know, uh, when you send data to, when you say send the uh, X locations to the black box, collect more, de collect more data, right? Then naturally you have more data to update your surrogate model. And as long as, uh, soon as you have more data, then your surrogate model will become more certain about oh, what, what, the, what, what my guess of the underlying F0 function, right? And then uh, slowly getting there about oh, where would the local optimum will be. Okay, 
Okay, very good. So you basically just finishing finish this loop. So this is the uh, the idea of uh, basic optimization. So you know, you, so usually speaking, basic optimization often actually use Gaussian process because uh, 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 the sausage plot there is actually very nice for uh, the uh, uh, making uh, using some good behavior of uh, basic optimization. But uh, as long as you have a uh, regression model that can also include a uncertainty estimate like basic neural networks, that you can also do it. Uh, 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 also use it in basic optimization. Okay, so um, let's see the simplest way to uh, make it work. Okay, so um, there are a bunch of uh, different acquisition functions that you can use. I mean, in fact, uh, th this afternoon's lecturer, Miguel, is an expert in basic optimization. So if you do have advanced questions, I would refer you to him. But the simplest way is basically you just get uh, what is called alpha confidence bound. Right, you get the current mean prediction from your posterior, and then uh, plus some amount of uncertainty. So basically, what is happening here is we actually compute uh, the green curve, okay, as the acquisition function, and then we figure out okay, where is the maximum of this green curve? So it should be somewhere around here. Okay, if this will tell you that uh, um, we are going to choose the input at this location. Okay, and then send it to the black box to query for the next point. Okay, so this is the sim simplest method. There are other methods as well, but uh, I, will, I believe this is very e easy to implement. So yes, so there is another part uh, of this tutorial. Okay, so... In the interest of time, because I think this is only one thing that I asked you to fill in, which is the UCB, right? As I mentioned to you that uh, uh, the upper confidence bound objective is essentially mean plus some scaling times uh, variance. And yeah, from basic neural networks, you just get multiple uh, samples, right? With K equal that greater than one sample. And then you estimate the corresponding mean and the standard deviation from those uh, multiple four passes and then return the UCD uh, uh, acquisition function. Okay, so if you run this on the, using let's say the previous uh, interesting periodic function as the, as the underlying ground truth and then run basic optimization with UCD and this is what happens. Okay, so long story short, um, so first, we are going to start from a few points. So in, in here, I'm plotting you the mean and the uh, scaled at a summit uncertainty, right? And in here, the green curve has the maximum around here. And this is the point that I sent to the black box for next round's query. And the black box tells me that the uh, noisy output from this ground truth function is somewhere here. I start the uh, procedure again to fit the uh, posterior, right? So this is the observation. Sorry for the, this is a little bit shift in terms of the uh, y axis. So if you plot the green curve again for the next round, it tells you that, okay, the maximum of the green curve is somewhere here, which means I should send this input to the black box for query. And the black box tells me, okay, the noisy uh, evaluation will give me result here. So you continue, okay. I think the interesting bit is if you run through this example yourself, right? Then you can basically see that actually in this case, the Bayesian neural network kind of always asks the evaluation at this location, right? You can basically see that for other locations, right? There is <laughs> nearly no new points being queried, which is actually a very interesting bit uh, of basic optimization. So how it works, right? So the reason here is that, uh, you know, in order to get the uh, local, uh, in order to get the local maximum, right? There is no need to know the behavior of the function all over the place if you're only interested in the local maximum. So this basically means that uncertainty estimation here will help you in two ways. One, 
quickly figure out the regions that they, the, the model thinks there is no hope that the uh, maximum is not there, right? This is clearly shown by the, uh, say the green curve that these regions has no hope. At least the model believes there's no hope, okay? Then it will basically skip the, those regions, right? And the second thing here is essentially, so for the regions that uh, it has high uncertainty, Unless it is very already very, very close to the local optimal you want, otherwise it will uh, uh, stop acquiring there. I mean, if you look at the uncertainty here, I mean, so mean field, this is using mean field uh, version inference that uh, the uncertainty quality is not great, but essentially I think the point here is the uncertainty here is actually smaller, right? But uh, since this is uh, the region that uh, uh, has no hope, the, net, uh, the acquisition function decides not to carry here. So here, the uncertainty is also fairly small, uh, but uh, since it is also actually very close to the um, um, maximum point, you keep querying there. So I think this is you know, a nice example in terms of showing how uncertainty estimate can be used uh, in, uh, say, some sequential decision making problems. So there is a little bit uh, uh, unfortunate thing here uh, that uh, it is not a sausage plot because you know you can basically see that right now for with mean field variation inference that the, you get a, a fairly homogeneous uh, estimate uh, across all the way. I mean, maybe for the other uh, it's beginning it's not the case, but as soon as you get more data points uh, in this particular example, you get uh, pretty homogeneous, uh, fairly homogeneous uh, estimate of uncertainty so that it is uh, uh, not discriminative enough in terms of telling how uncertain your model is, but with the sausage plot for Gaussians, it, at least it is very certain around the points it has observed so that it can be a little bit more efficient. Okay, so um, let's have uh, maybe five minutes quick break. And after that, I'm going to say a little bit more about classification. Okay, so in the interest of time, I think we should uh, uh, go through some other things uh, uh, quickly. And uh, there are some other tutorials done online that uh, you can look at and play around uh, yourself. But, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the decomposition of uncertainty. Okay, so um, at the very beginning, when I motivate why you want to use basic neural networks, right? I use this example of uh, OD or adversarial input to demonstrate uh, what could happen if you have, let's say, good approximation or bad approximation to the example theory, right? So let's dive into that, that uh, example a little bit more and see what is the underlying assumption or hypothesis of that uh, example. Okay, so the hypothesis is uh, the following. So first, uh, uh, the adversarial examples are regarded by us as out of distribution data, well, even if it looks very similar to the clean data, right? Okay. And the second, you know, the, the idea of the whole Bayesian paradigm is that you want to be uncertain around the things that uh, the model don't know or the model doesn't know, okay? So that means hopefully Bayesian neural networks will become uncertain about their prediction on out of distribution data. Okay, so combining both points, um, our hope is that uh, you can use some kind of uncertainty measure for detecting adversary samples. Okay? Very good. Okay, so the question here is essentially what kind of uncertainty measure we are going to use? Okay, so um, in Bayesian neural networks, uh, there is this uh, interesting equation says, <laughs> Total uncertainty equals to epistemic uncertainty plus aleatory uncertainty. Okay, so the words looks a bit uh, uh, interesting, but uh, I mean, epistemic uncertainty is sometimes also uh, uh, referred as model uncertainty, which is basically the model's belief after seeing the data, 
right? And it can actually be reduced when you have more data. Essentially, you know, when you have infinite amount of data, right? Then uh, you are hoping that your model will be certain around its uh, prediction for the ground truth function, okay? But there is another part of the uncertainty estimate, which is aleatorial uh, or data uncertainty, and this is irreducible. So if you go to this coin flipping example, right? It means that, you know, after infinite number of flipping of the same coin, I'm going to be very, very certain about whether this coin is fair or not. But I can, I cannot tell you what is, <laughs> no, the next coin flip outcome. Okay, so I think this is an important distinction between uh, the epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty is, re is reducible when you have more data points. Aleatorial uncertainty is irreducible because it is about individual experimental outcome. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so conceptually you do have this equation of uncertainty, but how do we actually uh, translate that into quantitative numbers or values? So one prevalent way to express uncertainty in a single value is to compute what is called the channel entropy. Okay, so in classification example, where your data, uh, your, the likelihood term is going to be um, categorical distribution, right? So this is the expression that you are going to compute the entropy. I mean, if this expression is uh, strange or new to you, it's fine. Don't worry too much about it. But the main point here is to give you a sense or a feeling about how it actually measures uncertainty, right? So you can actually show that um, this entropy measure will be maximized when you have a uniform distribution around all the classes, right? And when you have uniform distributions, then it means that I'm really, really uncertain about which class outcome it will be, right? So high entropy tells you I'm very uncertain. On the other hand, you can actually show that entropy at least in the discrete uh, variable case, is non-negative, sorry, uh, non-negative, and it will go to zero only when uh, you're going to uh, have a class that has probability one. So, I mean, so this is maybe not uh, strictly the case, but if you make this uh, bar even lower, right, and make this bar higher, then you will essentially get a uh, distribution that has entropy goes to zero. And in this case, it tells you, oh, I'm very, very certain, or I'm completely certain about my prediction result being in particular class. So again, you can see here that low entropy corresponds to low uncertainty. So it tells you that entropy is a good quantitative measure to express uncertainty. Okay, very good. Okay, so now we have um, entropy, right? Um, but you need to discuss which distribution you are going to use to compute entropy, right? So um, in prediction for basic neural networks, we are actually using the Bayesian predictive, right? By averaging the results from the posterior, which means you can actually compute the uh, entropy on this uh, predictive uh, distribution. And this is actually, that will compute the total uh, uncertainty, okay? Uh, bear with me, I will tell you why, okay? So uh, you can also actually compute the entropy on this uh, uh, single network output and the average over all possible different networks. And this is actually con called conditional entropy under the posterior. And it will actually give you the aleatory uncertainty. The difference between them <laughs> is the mutual information between your prediction y and the parameters theta, and this is going to give you the epistemic uncertainty. Okay, so in practice, yes, you just use Monte Carlo to compute it, right? Because we use Monte Carlo all the way to approximate integrals. So this is how you do it for the total entropy or the total uncertainty. And uh, yeah, you also do the same thing for the conditional entropy. Okay, so let me say a little bit more about why this is uh, capturing aleatory uncertainty. Okay, so um, imagine that you're going to collect more and more data. 
And hopefully this means that my posterior is going to concentrate more. And at the end of the day, it's going to concentrate uh, uh, towards a delta mass around a single parameter, right? And in this case, I will probably claim that I'm, I'm, I have no model uncertainty or no epicenter uncertainty because I'm very certain around the function, the, the function shape. Okay, but if you think about the uh, prediction, right, even when the Q distribution is centered around the one particular value, you still need to compute P of Y star given X star and theta. And this is a categorical distribution that might not be, say, uh, centered around one class. Let me repeat again. Even if you only use one deterministic theta parameter, your P distribution of P of Y star given X star and theta can still be a uh, distribution with non uh, zero entropy. And this actually describes you know, the uncertainty of that particular data point prediction. And this corresponds to data or aleatorial uncertainty. Okay, so yes, so you know, uh, from this uh, top equation here that uh, you can basically just you know get back the episode uncertainty by computing the difference between the total one and the aleatory uncertainty right and you can actually show that this is relevant to uh, mutual information okay so this is in practice how you're actually going to compute it um, but so to understand what are the intuition behind it, maybe we can go back to the sort of like the exact form, assuming that you can compute the exact posterior. So um, it basically means that you're going to replace, let's say this average with expectation under the posterior and you do the same thing here, okay? So if you um, uh, do the math, okay, then you can actually rewrite the mutual information as this conditional KL form, okay? So what does this mean? So essentially this mutual information tells you what the model thinks. Yeah, this is, a, this is for the model, okay? What the model thinks, the posterior is going to change if I, ask, if I supply one more data point. X star, okay? And the and, and query for the corresponding say Y star. Okay, so um, it's a little bit complicated, but let, bear with me. Okay, so um, first, you know, in terms of like reducing uncertainty, right? So we want to actually query next points that can basically, you know, maximally reduce the uncertainty, right? So that explains uh, why uh, you want some uncertainty measure of epistemic uncertainty, okay? And secondly, so if you look at this KL term, right? So when KL is large, it tells you that the updated uncertainty is very, very different from the current uncertainty. And hopefully this difference comes from reduction of uncertainty, right? So it means that if you can maximize this KL, then somehow you're trying to maximally decrease the uncertainty, right? So now it boils down to choose the point that can maximally reduce uncertainty. And this thing tells you, right, what the model thinks where I can get the maximal change. Okay, so in other words, these also reflect that currently the model after observing the data set D are very uncertain about a data point X, uh, the, the, the output for X star if this mutual information is very high. Okay, it's a little bit complicated, but I hope to, uh, I explain uh, um, in an okay way. Okay, so let's see some examples. Yes, there's not there there are there are not too much in things that for you to ask uh, to implement this, but um, the idea here is that you can actually use it to detect adversary samples, and right. So episode uh, for adversary samples, right? So there is this uh, uh, very powerful attack called projected gradient descent, which basically trying to uh, use a very powerful optimization tool to figure out the uh, 
adversarial samples within, let's say, a very small uh, distance of the clean sample so that the network produced the wrong prediction on that adversarial sample. Okay, so yeah, so those are the attacks. And uh, here I'm just visualizing to you that if you're going to attack a deterministic neural network, right, and for a mini batch, so this is a mini batch of 100 uh, 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 data points. And then as you increase the distance that you can perturb, essentially the classification accuracy on this adversarial sample quickly drops to zero, which means that uh, the attack has successfully found adversarial examples. And if you look at those examples, right? So let's look at maybe uh, these ones, okay? So yeah, they still look visually, you know, uh, similar to the class that you are supposed to predict. But you can basically see that the network, you know, uh, produced the wrong prediction. For example, like in this case, it produced the prediction nine, and in this case, it produced prediction one. Okay, so definitely this is our adversarial examples. Okay, so we can do the similar stuff for uh, uh, basic neural networks, and in this tutorial, uh, you you will actually see, you know, you can try out MC dropout method, uh, like here, or the uh, mean field version inference, uh, here. Okay, and uh, there is actually also this empirical trick that you can actually ensemble a number of basic neural networks together. And uh, I mean, there are, there are debates to tell whether ensemble or deep ensemble methods are Bayesian or not, right? And I think you can actually show that uh, ensemble methods and uh, this, let's say, let's say mean field version inference can actually be combined uh, together in a very comfortable way. And the corresponding objective is still a lower bound of the uh, origin of the marginal likelihood. And this is what we did in these uh, parts that we are going to ensemble a, num uh, a number of mean field version inference based neural networks. So, okay. So we produce a bunch of adversarial attacks and it gives maybe a little bit better robustness, but I won't say too much, but we can again use it to detect a uh, uh, adversary samples by computing the uncertainty matrix, as I said, let's say the, the, the entropy, right, and the mutual information. And then you compute this on both the uh, clean samples and the adversarial samples. You pick a threshold, okay, you pick a threshold to cut off and say, okay, if the uncertainty is greater than this threshold, I would say this is uh, out of distribution, right? If this is below the threshold, I would say this is in distribution. And you want to pick this threshold in a way to balance between getting good uh, true positive rate and false positive rate, right? Because uh, uh, it is usually not the case that you will get, let's say, perfect uh, detection results without any error. And this is what we do. So um, basically, um, um, in this case, we computed uh, quite a bit of different uncertainty metrics, right? And uh, try to uh, find the threshold so that I you know, restrict the positive positive rate of say um, wrongly uh, saying the in distribution example is out of distribution example. I'm, I'm going to restrict this rate to be less than 5%. So this is what you can get in terms of the best true positive uh, rates for detecting adversarial samples if you use different kinds of uh, uh, uncertainty. So there are a few observations here, and also you can also look at the, uh, the uh, uncertainty values produced in this uh, tutorial. That first, uh, at least in this example, if you use fairly small dropout rates like 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, Actually, the diversity of solutions are not great. So this is reflected by, you know, the worst detection results in terms of mutual information because mutual information, as I said, only reflects the epistemic uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty in many cases comes from diversity of solutions. Okay, but um, even the diversity of the solutions are, are not great. In terms of each of the solutions they get, they still get a pretty high aleatory uncertainty 
which means that you know the logic or the kind of the, the softmax probabilities are basically like a quite flat. So you can still get a pretty good uh, um, detection result in this case, although it's an interesting bit here that is that it start to drop. I guess that's maybe maybe because the adversarial attacks are way too strong. Okay. So yeah, so this is what happens with uh, uh, MMC dropout. So let's change to another uh, network. So this is the result that you can get if you use one mean view version of inference uh, 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 approximation on uh, Bayesian convolutional neural networks. Okay, so I would say that in terms of the mutual information result, it's a little bit better. Okay, so um, yeah, at least in terms of the detection result, it gets a, a better than the uh, MC dropout one for the uh, uh, red curve, but still not too great. Um, for the total and conditional entropy ones, uh, they are also uh, getting okay result, but also not stellar. Okay, so um, as you've uh, done today's uh, tutorial exercises that you also real, uh, figure out that, you know, for mean field variation, it gives you some okay result, but uh, in many cases uh, might not be, uh, say, the best uh, of the things you want. Okay, so let's try ensemble. So as I said, you know, you can basically uh, do ensemble methods and uh, say the basic neural network approximation methods all together, right? And this is the result that you are going to get if you're going to ensemble five mean field version inference uh, basic neural networks. Okay, so um, I would say that in terms of like the uh, mutual information detection result, it definitely gets more improved, which also, if you also look at the uh, actual, uh, Quantitative values of the mutual information it will actually be higher, which also reflect that you have more diversity in terms of the solutions you get. But also, you can see that there is a pretty significant boost, right? In terms of like the uh, uh, detection result, if you use say uh, total uncertainty. I think the interesting bit for these examples in all the three cases is that you actually see that the uh, say the blue curve right, gives you the best result. And the blue curve corresponds to aleatorious uncertainty. So this might reflect, uh, you know, the behavior of the adversarial attacks or in terms of like the weakness that the adversarial attacks wants to exploit. Okay, so I guess you know, if you use some other type of attacks, you might actually see different uh, kind of curve and from different curve and different visualizations, I think this you can also tell like, okay, um, the adversarial attacks are trying to target for different parts of the neural network or different properties of neural networks. Okay, so uh, I'm almost out of time, but uh, let me quickly mention uh, what are the advances, things that uh, uh, you might want to look at if you are interested in these topics more. And I'm hoping that Miguel will uh, cover some of them this afternoon, okay? Yes, so um, we talked about regression and briefly about classification, right? But there are way more applications that you can do with neural networks, right? So uh, at least in computer vision, Segmentation is a very, very important task that is being used in, let's say, you know, uh, autonomous driving that you definitely need to understand which part is the role, which part is the uh, uh, um, people, which part is the tree or whatever. So, okay. So, um, it, but if you are actually going to train a uh, segmentation network in some city and then trying to, you know, make it work better in terms of other cities that you've never seen, let's say you train it in, in uh, California, but then you are going to test in the UK, right? <laughs> so they, they will be quite different. So in this case, if you want to have a sort of a, like a uh, robust and trustworthy uh, um, uh, result, you need to produce some kind of uncertainty estimate. And you can basically use basic neural networks to do it and then produce both uh, aleatory and also epistemic uncertainty estimate. So this is within this paper, I think the interesting bit is if you compare these two figures, right? So the aleatory uncertainties are very concentrated around, let's say the edges, right? For the edges, you're mo in mo many cases that you can be, you are always going to be quite uncertain, especially when you have noise. But if with epistemic uncertainty, it has detected some kind of regions that maybe the network has uh, seen less example around it. Okay, so yeah, so this is one of the applications that you can do. I think uh, um, these kind of ideas can also be generalized to uh, medical uh, image segmentation. 
right? But for medical imaging, there are also other problems that uh, people might be interested in, which is super resolution. Okay, so in super resolution, it's basically so you get some sort of say, uh, uh, MRI scans for say part of your body, like in this case, the brain, right? But maybe they are because of some problems of sensing, uh, there might be some blurriness, right? In the uh, obtained image, then, then you want to enhance the quality of the image using some machine learning models, okay? But you know, uh, super resolution itself is actually a ill-defined task in the sense that given the same um, low resolution image, you can basically have you know a lot of different high resolution image that uh, correspond to the same low resolution image. So it means that uh, you need to consider uh, different possible solutions and then get uncertainty around it. And this is one of the works that uh, uh, has been produced by the uh, people from the medical imaging uh, um, community that uh, you may want to have a look. So I think um, in this case, I mean, they call it different ways, like intrinsic uncertainty or parameter of uncertainty. And actually we can see this, they call, epi they call epistemic uncertainty as parametric, uh, parameter uncertainty, and they call um, aleatorial uncertainty as intrinsic uncertainty, well, intrinsic to the data, right? So uh, there are some interesting uh, different behaviors around this uh, region where you do have, let's say, the tumor around. Okay, so another uh, application is definitely, you know, the Bayesian modeling paradigm is, is kind of like sequential naturally because you can keep on incorporating new observations and update your posterior, right? So this also tells you that you can also do this in a task level. So uh, continual learning is the uh, paradigm that tries to train a neural network sequentially on a series of different tasks and make sure that this neural network can um, basically uh, remember how to perform well on all the tasks it has seen before. Okay, so previously, I think uh, uh, um, people have shown that you know, if you do deterministic neural networks uh, without sort of like further regularization or further other techniques, then the, the deterministic neural networks suffers a lot. Uh, from what is called the catastrophic forgetting in the sense that after training on the current task, it forgets to how to solve the previous task. But you can also do the same. You can also actually solve this problem in the Bayesian way, in the sense that if you think about the concentration of the posterior, right? It's basically just you know, um, uh, incorporating the knowledge on the fly. And also, if you're going to uh, say, uh, do a continuous learning with Bayesian paradigm, then the posterior from the previous time step can be used as the prior knowledge for the current time step which might also give you a boost in terms of learning current tasks because you know, there might be similarities of the previous task to the current task so that you can use the knowledge that you learned before to you know, further enhance the learning of the current task. So we did uh, this uh, paper on what is called variational continual learning that it describes how you actually you know, frame, uh, say, continual learning in a Bayesian, uh, sequen uh, Bayesian uh, sequential um, updates framework. And then because as again, the exact posterior is intractable, so that we just use approximate inference again. Okay, so version inference. Okay, so we talk about the applications. I mean, there are more. I'm, I'm hoping that this afternoon you can hear some more uh, from Miguel. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the recent advance, uh, progress in Bayesian, Bayesian neural networks in terms of the inference method, because you know, we, we've seen that the computing the posterior is one of the most biggest challenges here. So um, apart from doing deterministic approximation, you can definitely do what is called sampling or MCMC, right? So, um, but I think in the neural network case, right, because you have a lot of parameters, then just directly doing MCMC might not be uh, easy. But instead, you can also explore the fact that, you know, gradient descent is easy in training neural networks. And then uh, combine MCMC and gradient descent together to get what is called the stochastic gradient MCMC. Okay, so simply stochastic gradient MCMC method is called uh, SGLD or stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics, which is very similar to SGD, but it said that uh, you are going to add in the right amount of noise to basically uh, uh, perturb the uh, gradient descent solution. Okay, so you can actually show that uh, with the uh, 
uh, right amount of noise and also the uh, schedule of the linear rates, uh, you can actually uh, show that yeah, you can get uh, the posterior samples at least in the mode of the inside posterior. We've talked about dropout, okay. So um, in parametric approximations, right? So, so far we talk about like computing the outputs using sampling, right? But it means that you need to do multiple forward passes which might be uh, uh, very time consuming in practice, right? So people have also tried to see, okay, whether I can directly approximate the mean and the variance of the output given a specific form of the Q distribution. And I think in fact for uh, uh, some neural network architectures and also some Q distribution you can do so. And these are the reference that you may want to look at. So finally, so uh, some students come to ask me this question, and I think it's very interesting that, uh, you know, um, you can see so far for many of the tasks, what we actually care is the uncertainty estimation in output space. I never show you any figure in terms of visualizing what's happening in the waste space, right? I only show you things happening in the function space, which basically means that if you have a way to, you know, directly model or approximate the posterior of the neural network function in the output space, then I think you are doing a more direct uh, uh, approach and might get a better result. But this is method is actually uh, pretty complicated, um, uh, more difficult than Gaussian process, but uh, yeah. Okay, I think Miguel today is maybe he's going to talk about Laplace approximation, which is another class of uh, approximate inference methods that I didn't talk about. Okay, so there are some theories about these. So there are connections to Gaussian processes. If you are interested in a shameless plug is that I'm going to talk about uh, how basic neural networks connect to Gaussian processes in the, the Gaussian uh, process summer school in, uh, in Sheffield this September. Okay, and uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, analysis around in terms of how uh, approximate inference uh, um, in weight space perform uh, as compared with, let's say, exact solutions like HMC. So this is one of the uh, results that we've obtained in terms of describing uncertainty for these what we call in between regions, where these are the regions in the gaps between data. So you can basically see that the exact posterior simulated by HMC gets some good uh, uncertainty, but you cannot get it from uh, mean field variation inference. And in fact, in some neural networks, we can prove this is the case, not because of uh, um, automatization error, because of the restrictions of the mean field uh, approximations. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to stop here because we are out of time, but here are the interesting um, um, questions or research questions that uh, at least in our community, uh, we are thinking a lot about it. So one thing that I want to mention here is essentially in this tutorial, I completely ignore the dimension of designing priors for basic neural networks. Okay, you probably noticed that. So, and also in, in, in practice, the Gaussian prior is essentially what I would say a more convenient choice rather than let's say the choice that we really want to make okay so um i think the interesting bit is that uh, it's actually quite hard to think about uh, uh choosing priors in weight space unless you want some properties like you know uh, preferring sparsity in weight space right it will be it's actually easier to think about how you're going to choose priors be, uh, according to your belief of the function behavior and that's basically why you know uh, actually gps are more popular in terms of thinking around prior behavior but uh, there are connections between dnns and gp and again uh, i'm not going to re uh, repeat my shameless plug okay so yeah Okay, so thanks for a lot for coming. So um, I think um, um, I'm going to stop here. And I'm not going to you know, um, stop you from getting lunch, but if you have questions, you can come along and then ask.